over 2 million Bitcoin are lost forever. So how do you make sure you're not part of that statistic? Let's mine deep. There are a lot of different ways to own Bitcoin out today, but even the so-called biggest holders of Bitcoin like BlackRock and MicroStrategy don't technically own the one thing that invariably proves to the protocol that those coins are yours, the private key. There are a few things to consider when it comes to Bitcoin security, but if you only know one thing about storing Bitcoin safely, it should be this. Your private key is your Bitcoin. Anyone else who has your private key also has your Bitcoin. So is keeping your Bitcoin safe as simple as keeping your private key safe? Well, yeah, actually. Except simple as it may be to buy Bitcoin these days, keeping it impossible to reach by others is the real challenge. For instance, people will buy Bitcoin on an exchange and not realize the exchange holds the private key. They leave it there. That's exactly how the victims of the Mt. Gox hack lost their Bitcoin and how this guy afforded trips on a private jet. Having your Bitcoin stolen might mean never actually owning the private keys in the first place, but it could also mean having your keys stolen. So how could this happen? There's three main ways to get your keys stolen. Fission software, social engineering, malware. Phishing sites are fake websites created by hackers and designed to fool victims into believing they are giving their information to a trusted person or company. They look like normal domains or emails, but maybe there's a small difference in the spelling that is undetectable at first glance. Once the user has entered their private key into the fake website or email, it's sent directly to the hacker and used to move the Bitcoin to one of their own addresses. So how do we prevent against this? Firstly, never enter your private key or seed phrase into a website or email. That's crazy. There are no honest applications that will ever ask you for this, period. Oh yeah, and double check those prescriptions. Second, social engineering. This is when scammers use manipulation tactics to steal access to your identity, with SIM swaps being one of the most common exploits. You shouldn't keep your Bitcoin on exchanges, but if you do, even having the most common two-factor authentication methods enabled isn't enough. Hackers can contact your phone provider to gain access to your SIM details allowing them access into your authentication apps. To avoid this, make sure you've talked with your phone provider to see what options there are to prevent a SIM swap attack and take any precautions necessary. The last exploit, malware, is slightly trickier to prevent and occurs when you store your private key on an internet connected device. Hear me out. If hackers can compromise your computer, they can find your private keys despite being on the other side of the world. When you create your Bitcoin private key, use a wallet software that can do as much of this process offline as possible. But what if you need your private key to sign and broadcast a transaction online? This is where signing devices come in, often called hardware wallets. These gadgets are not connected to the internet, but they do hold your private key and they allow you to sign transactions safely offline before broadcasting them to the entire network. This is the single safest way to store your Bitcoin. And as long as your private key is generated offline, stays offline, and you never lose it, you'll never lose your Bitcoin either. So why should you care? There's a lot to unpack here, and this isn't a one hour Bitcoin security tutorial. But if I could boil it down to one message, everybody wants your Bitcoin. Some people will try and sell you something for it, but others will stop at nothing to take it from you. The most important part of your Bitcoin journey isn't buying it for the first time, it's keeping it. Hackers will work harder than Nicolas Cage to steal yours. I'm gonna steal the Declaration of Independence. But no other asset on earth offers so many ways and layers to keep it secure. Signing devices, multi-sig, offline wallets. Equip and educate yourself with the right tools for self-custody. And your Bitcoin won't last a few cycles. It'll last a generation. And my last point to you, you do not sell your Bitcoin. Don't miss Shinobi Backstage. So one of the topics that I wanted to talk to you about was multi-sig. What is multi-sig 
and what does it mean whenever you go to spend your bitcoin uh everything is locked to a specific public key like or most people would know your address uh, and in order to actually spend those coins you have to make a cryptographic signature with the the private key that matches that public key multi-sig is just essentially a scheme where you have more than one keys involved in that address and you have to produce signatures with multiple keys to spend your coins so you could say have an address made up of three different keys and in order to spend you have to sign with two of them and the whole idea is in order to keep your coins safer um, having three of those separate keys and needing multiples of them you can spread them around um, secure them in different places and let's say a thief was able to get a hold of one of them your coins are still safe because he needs a second key in order to actually spend anything whereas if you were just using a, a normal wallet with a single key once the thief got access to that one key he, he can take all of your coins and that was a huge issue with the multi-sig it's just like the the general purpose of it um satoshi actually implemented multi-sig in a, a really inefficient way in the very first version of bitcoin and that was kind of part of the logic there is just to offer different ways to to secure your coins um w without just enforcing like the, this single key single mechanism where if anything is lost or stolen like your money's just gone the so the multi-sig offers you a way to spend bitcoin like or let's say what happens if one of the person dies the interesting thing here is like how you manage these keys there's a lot of different ways you can do it you you can keep all of the keys yourself and that will protect you off the bat let's say one of the hardware wallets you use or a software wallet is backdoored or compromised if you just had one key and you were using that device well your your coins are gone but if you have a multi-sig setup with different wallets different hardware devices one of those could be compromised or backdoored and your coins are still safe and the the other aspect of it is actually you know like you were implying having multiple people hold the keys involved like you could have a friend or a family member hold one as a backup in case the out of the two you kept you lose one or misplace it or whatever and then there, there's also the potential um a lot of companies like unchained casa uh, nunchuck actually offer as a service holding one of those keys for you a, a professional business making a service out of that like their whole business model is offering that protection so they're going to take it much more seriously than say a family member who doesn't know or care about bitcoin but is that safe trusting somebody else with the keys to your coins well the the way those services work is they never hold enough keys to spend the coins by themselves like if we go back to the the two of three example a service like that would only ever hold one so you they still need you and one of the keys that you have to move any coins like they're they're not capable of spending your money without you involved and you signing with one of the keys that you have what happens when you die what happens to the bitcoin then is it lost well that that's another thing that a lot of these services can do like let's say the the three keys involved a service has one of them you have one of them you could give the the third one to like your wife uh, your kids or a family member and if something unfortunate like your passing were to happen um that company could kind of assist them in recovering your money and like you know go through the process of verifying that you did in fact die um that that person has a legal claim to whatever assets that you owned while you were alive and then help them recover it